The 20th century saw dramatic changes in moral behavior, especially in what are known as the Western nations, principally Europe and the English-speaking world of North America, Australia, and New Zealand. To a great degree, this was a result of the Darwinian view that we are the product of blind chance rather than supernatural intelligence. The atrocities of World War II also caused people to question whether such carnage could happen in the presence of a loving God. Penicillin and the pill played a part in freeing people from two of the greatest fears of intimacy outside of marriage, pregnancy and disease. Only the perception changed, not the problems. Premarital pregnancies still happen at an alarming rate, and STDs are ever-present, debilitating, and deadly. Then there were the intellectuals, the secular evangelists of the new morality. Freud, Kinsey, William Masters and Virginia Johnson, Edward Brecker, and others. They aimed to liberate us from our repressive Victorian past. Regardless of the cause, the effects have been dramatic. Behaviors that were once shameful are now considered normal. Isn't it time that we ask, is the direction we chose working? Has our new morality, or better yet, our lack of morality, left us better or worse? Is it not time to reevaluate? Today on Tomorrow's World, I'm asking and answering the question, does marriage matter? So don't go away because I'll be right back to answer that question with the facts. Welcome to Tomorrow's World, where today we will explore the question, does marriage matter? This is no trivial question because I guarantee that every one of you who are watching this program are touched by the answer one way or the other. There was a dramatic shift away from moral values in the last century. A majority of people in professing Christian nations in America, Europe, and elsewhere once had a certain consciousness of God. Both Christians and Jews looked to some degree to the Bible and especially the Ten Commandments as the guiding light for behavior. Those rules tempered raw human behavior, but during the second half of the 20th century, Belief in God and morality in these nations deteriorated rapidly. The philosophy of secular humanism replaced the Ten Commandments in courts and educational institutions. Secular humanism expresses the view that humans can be ethical and moral without religion or God. But is this so? The problem is that people cannot agree upon what is moral and ethical. A quick internet search on the subject of adultery proves this point. From Psychology Today, Michael W. Austin, a Ph.D., writes, In my ethics courses, I discuss issues in family ethics with my students related to marriage and parenthood. We often discuss an essay by contemporary philosopher Richard Wasserstrom, Is Adultery Immoral? I believe the answer is clearly yes. But in another Psychology Today essay, Clifford N. Lazarus, another Ph.D., writes, In other words, there are both healthy and unhealthy reasons for having extramarital relations. Ironically, in some cases, a marriage can be strengthened by an affair. So while most of us who are married believe it is morally proper for our mates to be faithful to us, not everyone agrees. In Richard Wasserstrom's essay, he approaches a subject through human reason, presenting arguments from both sides of the question. Human reason is what philosophy is, and human reason is the curriculum of education at all levels. Thomas Paine published The Age of Reason in three parts between 1794 and 1807. Paine was a deist. He believed in a higher power but rejected revealed knowledge as found in the major religions and religious books such as the Bible. In effect, he substituted human reason for revelation. In the introduction to today's program, I ask these questions. Is the direction we chose working? Has our new morality, or better yet, our lack of morality, left us better or worse? 
And is it not time to reevaluate? What are the facts? Where has human reason led us? Let's look at three consequences of our human reasoned new morality. Consequence number one, the new morality is not good for marriages. This point is interesting because human reason and common perception don't match the facts. Human reason says it is good to test someone prior to marriage, whether he or she is compatible with you, as one would test drive an automobile or a boat before purchasing it. The United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports this finding in a 2016 National Health Statistics report. In 2011 to 2013, 60% of women and 67% of men agreed living together before marriage may help prevent divorce. This is what the majority of people think. But what are the facts? Jay Teachman of Western Washington University explains in a study titled Premarital Sex, Premarital Cohabitation, and the risk of subsequent marital disillusion among women, one of the most clearly defined correlates of cohabitation is an increased risk of marital disillusion. Marriages preceded by a spell of cohabitation are as much as 50% more likely to end in divorce at any marital duration than marriages not preceded by cohabitation. This is not what researchers expected to find. And that makes the findings even more impressive. Many studies are conducted to prove a point of view, but when the facts are different and are still reported honestly, you have a worthwhile study. Here's what they expected to find. Early investigators expressed surprise at this result because it had sometimes been theorized that premarital cohabitation would act as a screening device allowing couples to choose a mate with whom they could form a successful marriage. Study after study shows that humanly reasoned sleeping together prior to marriage has a poor track record. That's our first reason why marriage matters. On today's Tomorrow's World, I'm asking the question, does marriage matter? In the previous segment, we looked at one consequence of human reason when it comes to how we conduct ourselves prior to marriage. That consequence number one was, the new morality is not good for marriages. Now let's look at another reason why marriage matters. Number two, the new morality is not good for children. Unplanned pregnancies are common within marriage. How many of us were accidents? In marriage, there is a mother and father to love and care for a child, even when it's unplanned. But a child coming into the world outside of a stable parental relationship is a very different matter. The dynamics are not the same. According to Time Magazine Online, in a story by Amy Sullivan titled, Behind the Boom in Adult Single Motherhood, the group with the highest rate of unplanned pregnancies among single women is not teens as many suppose. It's actually single women in their 20s and fully seven of 10 pregnancies to these 20-somethings were unplanned. Now this creates a problem. Many women choose to abort their problem, but this has moral implications and may create long-lasting psychological issues not anticipated. But what about those who give birth? What are the consequences for both mother and child? Quoting Ms. Sullivan in the Time article, Study after study has shown that babies born to unmarried mothers are at higher risk of ending up in poverty and that the mothers themselves face educational and economic hurdles. And then what about the three in ten single women in their twenties who actually plan to have a child out of wedlock? Many excuses are given as to why so many are choosing babies before commitment. One such excuse is that of poverty. Men can't afford to raise a family. But is this reasoning valid? Advice columnist Emily Yoff, writing under the name of Prudence for Slate, a liberal online U.S. magazine, wrote the following in response to this argument. Scholar Kay Heimowitz, 
turns the argument around and says it's not that harsh economic conditions lead to women having children without fathers, but that the decision to have children without fathers leads to harsh and self-perpetuating economic conditions. She explains that having the belief that a solid marriage is central to one's life, that it precedes starting a family, encourages women and men to make important choices based on self-discipline and deliberation. This is a formula needed for upward mobility, qualities all the more important in a tough new knowledge economy. Ms. Yoff describes the current single parent scene in America as a national catastrophe. While she promotes the importance of marriage and family, readers respond with a variety of excuses such as, having a child will be stressful and life-altering enough. Parents need to work on their relationship on their time schedule. I feel that a baby is its own blessing. Have that blessing before you get married. How dare you imply that an unexpected pregnancy should lead to marriage? Note that these excuses are emotionally, not factually based. When Ms. Yof is confronted with the accusation, you are simply out of touch with modern culture, she replies, that may be. But it also means that modern culture is out of touch with the needs of children. Some researchers identify out-of-wedlock births as the chief cause for the increasing stratification and inequality of American life, the first step that casts children into an ever more rigid caste system. Studies have found that children born to single mothers are vastly more likely to be poor, have behavioral and psychological problems, drop out of high school, and themselves go on to have out-of-wedlock children. The problem with human reason is that humans reason differently, making this method of decision-making unreliable. Emotions and agendas get in the way of rational thinking. Sadly, children are sometimes conceived for all the wrong reasons, and the result is not good for children. Quoting once again from Ms. Sullivan, women are also vulnerable to the misconception that a pregnancy, even unintended, can cement a relationship and bring a couple closer together. In fact, all of the statistics show that babies stress relationships. More couples end up splitting than marrying. So far, we've seen that the new morality is not good for marriages or children. So far, we've seen that moral choices do matter. They matter to marriages and they matter to children. One can make a long list of negative consequences for choosing reason over revelation. Historians and social workers know that the breakup of families has a disastrous effect on the fabric of nations. But in this segment of our program, I'm going to focus on one indisputable negative consequence that ought to be evident to all, the spread of deadly and life debilitating diseases. So consequence number three, the new morality is not good for your health. Even though 2008 sounds like ancient history to most teens, little has changed since this shocking headline from the Centers for Disease Control appeared in newspapers across America. At least one in four teenage girls has sexually transmitted disease. The article explained at least one in four teenage girls nationwide has a sexually transmitted disease, or more than three million teens according to the first study of its kind in this age group. A virus that causes cervical cancer is by far the most common sexually transmitted infection in teen girls aged 14 to 19, the study from the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found. Among girls who admitted ever having sex, the rate was 40%. A more up-to-date headline from the CDC reports this for the year 2016. STDs increase across the country for the third year. But no worry, human reason will step in. Note this advice for young women. Instead of counseling them to be politically incorrect, and make decisions based on revelation, the advice given is based on human reason. Here's a little of what the vaunted CDC counsels young women. 
Note that it is an attempt to detect the result of dangerous behavior rather than avoid it. If you are a sexually active woman younger than 25 or have risk factors such as new or multiple sex partners, you should request annual chlamydia and gonorrhea tests. If you've never been tested for HIV, you should request an HIV test. Now let's be clear about this. These are not harmless infections. Depending on which STD, it can cause sterility, chronic pain, life-threatening ectopic pregnancies, sickening rest-of-life cocktail drug treatments, and even death. And what a joy it must be to be in the position where you have to report to the person you want to spend the rest of your life with that you have one of the many incurable kinds that can be passed to that partner. Now to be fair, the CDC does offer some options to avoid STDs, but they're just that, options. There's no encouragement to choose one over the other. The five they offer are abstinence, reduced number of partners, mutual monogamy, vaccination, and latex barriers. It should be noted that only two of these guarantee against these dangerous diseases, abstinence and mutual monogamy. Of course, the latter is only true if two people are faithful prior to and following their partnership. I hate to put it that way because I find the term partner to be repulsive, unless it's preceded by marriage. So what's the answer? The answer is that marriage matters when considering the most intimate of human relationships. And there are invisible laws at work that make for success or failure. The sexual revolution, what is often referred to as the new morality, really took off in the 1960s. It's not that everyone was free from acting as an alley cat prior to this time. Far from it. But the 60s saw a dramatic change in Western attitudes. Edward M. Brecker wrote the following in 1969. Here, I think, is a task for sex research an objective inquiry into the short-term and long-term effects on men, women, and children of emancipation from sexual repression, from feeling of sexual shame and guilt. This quote is found in Wendy Shalit's A Return to Modesty. Ms. Shalit responds to this statement with the following. So welcome, Mr. Brecker, to the world of postmodern sexual morality. In some respects, it has turned out more horrifying than even the inhibited might have imagined. The question, I guess, then becomes, is our guerrilla etiquette as good as the older rules? What are these older rules? Thomas Paine wasn't the first to exalt reason over revelation. But as we have seen, human reason is failing. As we've seen, the new morality is not good for marriage. The new morality is not good for children and the new morality is not good for your health. Long before Thomas Paine, the first two human beings were given instructions from an intelligent being far greater than them. That intelligent being knew all about chemistry and biology, anatomy, and invisible laws that, when kept, produce good results, but when broken, bring pain, sorrow, and death. This being understood these things because he was their creator, he gave our first parents a choice. They could accept revealed knowledge that would enlighten them regarding these invisible laws, or they could choose for themselves the prerogative to determine right and wrong. As all students of the Bible know, they chose poorly. They put their trust in their five senses and in their ability to reason. They would have been proud of Thomas Paine. But what are the results of their experiment? The results are all around us. Conflict between peoples and nations, broken families, divorce, disease, and suffering of every kind. The God of the Bible is not vague when it comes to relationships. The Bible makes it clear that God created us for intimacy. Here it is in the first chapter of this book that we know of as the Bible. Genesis, the first chapter, verses 27 and 28. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God He created him, male and female He created them. 
Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. A little later, God instructed the man to form a union that we call marriage. Chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Take careful note that there was no shame at this point, but that would soon change. After they made the choice to trust their own reasoning, they saw themselves differently. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now here is a critical point most people read right over. Verse 11, And he, that is God, said, Who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? It was only after our parents rejected revelation and chose their own way that they saw their bodies in a bad light. Yes, there is a spirit power that messes up the most intimate relationship between men and women, but it's not our Creator. The Bible tells us that full intimacy within marriage is good and proper. Marriage is an institution to be honored, but notice the difference between the married and the unmarried states. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. The Apostle Paul counsels us to avoid sexual immorality because it brings about painful penalties. Notice this in 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter and verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Our experiment in human reason has gone on way too long. The evidence is in. If we have eyes to see, we must conclude that the God of the Bible knows better than we do. Here at Tomorrow's World, we're not so naive as to think that we have the ability to change anyone's behavior. But we do believe that we can present the truth of the Bible along with factual information from which individuals can then choose. The results of human behavior are obvious. Disobedience to God's laws bring pain and suffering but obedience to His laws brings happiness to life. 